Our guest on This is America is Sally Bedell Smith, former cultural reporter for Time and the New York Times, contributing editor for Vanity Fair, and author of the New York Times bestseller, Elizabeth the Queen, The Life of a Modern Monarch. Sally, it's good to be with you. Thank you for coming. Great to be here, Dennis. Uh, is it <laughs> fair to say that the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, is the most famous woman in the world? Is that I'd fair? say so. Yeah? I'd say, particularly since she's been queen for 60 years now, longest serving world leader. For sure. Longest serving world leader. Absolutely. So when they say 60 years, uh, why should Americans, although I know we are invested in royalty, and we'll right. talk about that in a minute, but why should we know? Why should we care that this is her 60th uh, anniversary of sitting on the throne? Well, she's only the second British monarch to, to hit that milestone in a thousand years. The first one was her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, who celebrated her Diamond Jubilee in 1897 when she was 78 years old. And she, she remained on the throne until she, uh, she, almost 64 years, just shy of 64 years. So if this queen, who is now 85, mm -hmm. is still queen in September 2015, she wow. will surpass her great-great-grandmother's record. Uh, and they and call she it, certainly seems on track to do that. Well, she's, she's in, in good she's health, in huh? Very good health. She still, she still rides on her. She still rides horseback on the weekends. Wow. And Prince Philip, who is um, 90 years old, I was just talking to a friend of his the other day, and he said, you know, he was out um, doing his carriage driving last weekend at yeah, Windsor. He, he, yeah, he runs the and carriages. And somebody who had heart surgery a few months ago. The two of them are really. They have an unbelievable stamina. Let me let me ask uh, this uh, a question because it shows up in your book. Uh, somebody asked the queen, the queen one time, what do you do? Yes. What does the queen do? That's a fair well, question. Well, it she is was a fair of... question. It was the first time. It was at a garden party, and she was introduced to a woman. She said, what do you do? And the queen <laughs> was at a friend's birthday the other, you know, a few days later, and she said, I had no idea what to say. Nobody uh -huh. in all the years I've been meeting people, nobody had ever asked me that question. The fact is, and I w this was somewhat unexpected to me, she does a lot. Mm. She has a very wide range. She's not just a figurehead. She has a wide range of duties. She serves as head of state, obviously, um, representing her, her country uh, at home and abroad. She uh, spends, she has a very regimented work day. She spends three, four hours a day, mainly in the morning, but also in the evening, going over what, what are known as her government boxes. And they are red leather boxes that can only be opened with four separate keys, uh -huh. and inside those boxes are all manner of government documents. There are um, intelligence, confidential intelligence reports, reports on the proceedings of parliament, reports on the prime minister's cabinet meetings, um, diplomatic cables from overseas. So she has a, a great range of information that she takes in every day. And you might say, well, what does she do with that information? Mm -hmm. And she has now 60 years worth of it in her, wow. in her head. Uh -huh. Um, and what she, she, she also, part of her work day, is to have private audiences. The most famous private audiences people know about are the weekly audiences that she has with her prime ministers, mm -hmm. of which she has had 12, Whoa. starting with Winston Churchill, who was born in the 19th century and served in her great-great-grandmother's army, uh, all the way up to David Cameron, her 12th prime minister, who was born three years after her youngest son. Let me just uh, uh, interject this uh, question. What's the difference between the responsibilities of the queen and the responsibilities of the prime minister? Oh, vast. I mean, it's the, the power and the glory are, are separate. Uh, the, the, the prime minister is the, is the head of his government, and he is responsible for all the government decisions. But when the prime minister comes to visit the queen once a week in a private audience room, nobody there, nobody taking notes, completely confidential, he, and in one case she, Margaret Thatcher, um, mm. feel free to um, ask her advice. She's a fantastic sounding board. Her, her uh. remit is to be consulted, to encourage, and to warn. Yet, she doesn't specifically give advice, which is which is very interesting. And what she does is she asks really good questions and she may prompt and I've you know, I've written a lot in the book about her relationships with all her prime ministers. Mm -hmm. And even if they come in somewhat skeptical at the beginning, what can I learn from this, you know, from this woman, they learn very quickly, first of all, if they don't come prepared and she catches them out 
Harold uh -huh. Wilson, who was her first labor prime minister, said he felt, you know, sort of like a chastened schoolboy afterwards because mm. he didn't know the answer to some questions. And so when she meets with her prime minister, she, she will also have had meetings with um, <clears throat> senior figures in the military. Yeah, she's the head Sing of the military. The, she is the head of the military, senior figures in the Church of England and other churches, Church of Scotland. Um, people in the judiciary, diplomats who are from the from other countries, her own diplomats, and she also reads an enormous amount of correspondence, and she keeps her finger on what people's concerns are. And, and there's, a, there's a difference between ruling and reigning, isn't there? Yes, there is a difference. And is that kind of like the prime minister, the prime and, minister the, and the queen? Somebody once said when they were talking about Margaret Thatcher and the queen, they said, well, well, the, the queen is sort of like your mother. She sends you to school, and, and, and Margaret Thatcher is like the headmistress who <laughs> lays down the rules and tells you what you should do. Um, but, uh, but, they, but so she has this, this, you know, this great body of, of knowledge, and she, by all accounts, applies it very wisely. She knows what her limits are. She knows she shouldn't make overt public statements, for example. She has to maintain neutrality and sort of above politics. And, and I think all the people who meet her um, really value having somebody in that position who is sort of a wise guide, who mm. brings a lot of experience and accumulated wisdom. Must be very difficult to balance uh, history, tradition, and also uh, being a modern monarch. Yes, huh? and that's the subtitle of my yeah, book yeah, yeah. because I was really surprised by the degree to which all along the way she has modernized. Um, not overtly, sort of incrementally, so, yes. um, so it doesn't upset people too much. The pace has probably quickened a bit since Diana because um, the whole experience of having gone through that difficult week after Diana died when mm -hmm. people sort of turned against the queen um, for not coming to London right away. And so one of the things they did after Diana, and she gave a speech before Diana's funeral in which she said there are lessons to be learned mm -hmm. from the way Diana lived and also the reaction to her death. And they, um, <clears throat> they went to actually, for the first time, they went to a political pollster. Yes, yes, and they've um, got so PR Robert, involved Robert, now. Robert Worcester, and he did focus groups and he did a lot of polling. They were concerned that the public perceived them as being too inward looking. Mm. And what he was able to help them identify was what the values were that people ascribed to the monarchy, what, why it was important to people, and where they, could, where they could improve, how they could relate to people more, how they could respond more quickly, for example. Let me get one more question in before we take a little break. Um, your research is incredible. Thank you. Uh, the, the people that you had access to, you've met the Queen on a couple of occasions. Uh, what surprises you or intrigues you or excites you about now kind of being on the inside? What, what, what did you learn that really just blew you away? Well, I guess, I mean, obviously learning the, the way she goes about her work was, was fascinating to me, but, but kind of parting the curtain and learning what she is like as a wife and a mother and a friend and finding examples of all sorts of um, personality and character traits that people aren't terribly aware mm. of, that she can be very cozy. You know, she had uh, one of her friends told me about the time that he, he was painting a portrait of Prince Philip at Windsor Castle, and um, the queen invited him to, to have lunch in the dining room there, and he walked in, and there were no butlers around to serve them their meal, and instead she insisted on serving from a buffet, and not only did she insist on serving, she also cleared the table, <laughs> and he thought, my goodness, she was stacking the plates and everything. But there are, you know, and sort of images of her yeah. um, as a countrywoman. She's very down to earth, um, relaxing with her friends. She loves to sing. She loves to dance, you know, sitting on a box in one of the Outer Hebrides Islands uh, when they were on a cruise and belting out songs. They're just And she's so got a good sense of humor, right? Has, and, her, and also humility. Humility. Humility is a not was not expected. It's fascinating to listen to you talk about the Queen. Uh, Elizabeth the Queen, the life of a modern uh, monarch. Sally Bedell Smith is our guest. We're way behind on time. Sit tight, this is America. This is America is made possible by the National Education Association. 
the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. The Singapore Tourism Board, there's something for everyone. Singapore Airlines, a great way to fly. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust. A book is absolutely terrific on so many different levels, not only to get to know the queen, the family, uh, how it all operates inside, but also some of the history. Uh, and people know uh, the movies in the last couple of years, The King's Speech, right. which I gather the queen has seen. The queen has seen that. But yes. she didn't see the queen. She did not. <laughs> uh, that's the Helen Mirren yes. uh, a film. But going back, her father was George VI, right? Yes. And he took over because his brother, Edward VIII decided he didn't want to be king. Right. So the king, George VI, died pretty young, yes. and then she becomes queen at the moment of his death, uh, the investiture and all is later on. But she was 25 years old. 25. 25, homeschooled. Yes. Uh, in the war, she helped out her father. She was a mechanic, a good, did yeah. a mechanic she, school or something like that. She learned like how that. to bleed brakes and... <laughs> drive a two-ton truck and yeah, yeah, change yeah, yeah. truck tires. But it was homeschooling, right? And yes, it was, which was very typical of um, women, um, particularly in the aristocracy and certainly in the royal family. But that being said, she had high-quality governesses. And then when she was 10 years old, and as you said, her father became king quite unexpectedly, um, she then embarked on a more focused curriculum. Uh, with a very erudite tutor by the name of Sir Henry Martin, and he was a, he was uh, he was at Eton College, the boys' very you know prestigious boys' school mm -hmm. down the road, and she spent six years um, being tutored by him in the English Constitution, which is very unlike ours. It's um, an accumulation of laws and practices uh, over time. It's not a written document, and she. Um, there are there are uh, volumes that she studied and annotated and made marginal notes in and underlined and wow. you can see how conscientious she, she was. She also learned a lot from her parents, from mm. her mother and from her, her father. Her mother, yeah, yeah. And uh, the mother died at 101 years of yes. age, so yes. she would have been the queen mother. But um, when she got to be queen, her sister Prince Margaret yeah. said to her, uh, "Does this mean you're going to be?" When she was 10 and yeah. her father uh, became king, king, Margaret said, does this mean you will be queen someday? And then Princess Elizabeth said, yes, it does. And Margaret said, poor you. Wow. Yeah. Is it the weight of the world on her shoulder, queen, wife, mother? Uh, just amazing. It's, it's a lot for her to carry. And she did speak when she came. She was in Kenya when her father died. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, of a heart ailment in the middle of the night. She was yeah. off on a tour with her husband. She had been married. She'd been married to, um, Prince, Philip. to Pin Prince Philip back in 1947. She had a three-year-old son, an 18-month-old daughter, and she was off on a tour representing her father and came back and had her appearance before the Accession Council, which is the formal council that recognizes her as the, as the new monarch. And she talked about the heavy burden on her shoulders. Mm. But she accepted it in a spirit of what one of her archbishops of Canterbury, George Carey, told me was glad service. And it's, it's something she knew was her destiny. She accepted it. And she, subsequent to actually becoming king, queen, she, be, she had her coronation in June of 1953, which was where she made a very solemn vow to continue in her role until she died. Till death. Till death. Til death. Yep. How many palaces are there? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm up to at least five. Well, she has, obviously, she has Buckingham Palace. She has, you know, she Windsor has Windsor Castle. Castle. 
and then Balmoral. and then there's and the, well then there's Holyrood, um, which is the, the the palace in Edinburgh, and then she has several private residences: Balmoral in the Scottish Highlands and Sandringham up in Norfolk. So that sort of covers it. Two of them are private residences. Well, I read other... that in your book, the, the 775 rooms in Buckingham Palace yeah. alone. Yes. Buckingham Palace is really much more of an office building than a home. It's, it's, most of those rooms are offices. And it's not a very cozy place, or offices or vast public rooms that are used for entertaining. I want to know um, what it's like to live with people like the master of the robes, the master of the horses, women of the bedchamber, pages, ladies-in-waiting, right. ladies in waiting, yeah. countesses, earls, dukes, uh, barons. How do people live in that environment? Is it fun? Is it well, stodgy? Is, what, well, I think, you know, she obviously has to go around and do a lot of um, she has a very set calendar over the course of a year. Her, it's, it's outlined a year ahead. Six months in advance, they fill in the details. There are a lot of kind of set rituals she has to follow, but she does have fun, time to have fun. She has fun on the weekends. She loves to ride. She goes out with her, with her friends on shooting weekends where she has all her working dogs and she goes around and she pick up, picks up the pheasants that her husband and other people kill, you know, shoot out of the sky. But, um, you know, she's, it's just, it's, she's never known any other life. You know, yeah. she is, because of her hereditary position, everybody treats her with a special deference, including her children and her closest friends. They all have to curtsy and bow wow. when they greet her and when they say goodbye to her. I talked to one of her, one of her friends who knew her in childhood, and he told me about the time that the royal family came to visit his his family at their at their castle in Scotland, and he was fooling around, and he took her and he tossed her on a sofa, and his father, who was the twelfth Earl of Airlie, grabbed him by the arm, took him in the other room, and punched him in the stomach, and said, "Never do that to royalty." Whoa! So there is, you know, there is that deference that she expects. So there's a you know sort of a, a an invisible wall, if you will, that that separates. She is different. She lives in her own world. I'm amazed. Uh, there was a little reference in your book to 2008. In the 2008 year, uh, Prince Charles did 560 official engagements. Right. Queen Anne did 534, <laughs> and the Queen. This is only four years ago. 2008 yeah. did 417 official engagement. That's right. Well, I mean, that's, and then there's all this travel and all these long trips yeah. and that she goes, and, oh, I didn't ask you this question. What's the difference between the Commonwealth, the United Kingdom, and in the past, the empire? Okay. I wanted to get that clear <clears throat> in my mind. The United Kingdom is, she is the queen of the United Kingdom of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and she is also the queen of 15 realms around the world that include Canada, Jamaica, Australia, New Zealand, and, and others, and then there are 14 foreign territories. Now, the Commonwealth is the former British Empire that, starting in the late 1940s, all the countries that had been part of the British Empire, led by India and Ireland and others, began to, um, they began to become Republics, and they, you know, they, they, they got, they, they became independent, and, but the Commonwealth has stayed together. It now has 54 nations. It's a voluntary association. It's promote. It's dedicated to promoting good government and the environment, and, um, and a whole range of issues. And the Queen is the is the head of it. Uh, it's a that is a kind of a ceremonial. Role, but I was really so. Can countries opt out of the oh, Commonwealth? Sure. Or, and, and they, they can do. Be, and, and they, they can do. be kicked out. They can be kicked out for human rights violations, as Zimbabwe was, for example, oh. and others have been over the years. And they can also apply to uh, to be admitted. She played a, a kind of a behind the scenes role in South Africa. Didn't Absolutely, she, she was. Big uh, time. She, Big time. she she was a she was. Um, I had quite a few conversations with the former Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney, who mm -hmm. was very much involved in the in all the actions that were taken. 
to try and get rid of apartheid yes, and all the economic yes, yes, yes. sanctions and there were a lot there were a lot of controversial moments during that period there were moments when it seemed that the Commonwealth might even split up over it because mm -hmm. there was disagreement on the degree to which sanctions should be applied. And the Queen very deftly worked behind the scenes, applying a kind of a, as Brian Mulroney said, she, she sort of, she got them together and they had a kind of elevated discussion. Yeah, she elevated, never, yeah, She yeah. never expressed her opinion. She doesn't. No, She's but good, she yeah. gets people to come together. She got Margaret Thatcher, who was very much opposed to giving Rhodesia independence, for example, uh -huh. and she helped, as everybody said, bring down the temperature and get people to talk to each other. It's a very valuable role. Let me slip in a, a few things uh, before, the, uh, before we run out of time. She sleeps very well. She has no driver's license. She has no passport. She loves her horses, her dogs, yes. her crossword puzzles. Uh, very tolerant of other people's bad behavior, yeah. does not like confrontation, and that's cost her in regard to Princess Margaret and regard to the kids as well. Because, I think so. Because yeah. uh, four kids, they have four children, Charles, Anne, Edward, and Andrew, and they've all had problems, all well, of them. Yeah, I mean, the three, obviously. Three, but the, the wife of Edward is... She was, she was. Well, in the beginning, she had a bumpy start. But I have to say, Sophie, Edward's wife, is one of the Queen's favorites. Why did Fergie mess it up so much? Well, she was so well liked by the whole family, she was, and she really messed it up. She was, a, she was a country girl, and she loved to ride with the Queen. The Queen was very fond of her. And in fact, when Fergie misbehaved, and they had that very, she and Prince Andrew had that very messy divorce, it was the Queen who actually kind of reached out to her and felt sorry she for her. She could have stayed in the family if she, if she didn't have. try to sell some uh, entree. I think entree. We're, we're talking about some judgment problems there. Uh, Diana, the, uh, the Princess of Kent, uh, Michael says she was a catastrophe. She was uh, a, a time bomb. Uh, they should have seen it in advance, an accident waiting to happen. That was, that was so unfortunate. People loved her and uh, but that was a trying period of time. For it was the, a very difficult period for the monarchy for all throughout the 80s and well in almost to the end of the 90s. And the the basic problem is that is that Diana and Charles really didn't know each other when they got married. There was a big age gap, and they, it was a complete misalliance. They really had very little in common, even though she was from a you know one of the top aristocratic families. In fact, the Spencers had been part of the Whig group of Whig aristocrats who brought over the first uh, kings of Hanover um, in, in the early 18th century. And so that gave actually Diana a bit of sense of superiority mm. over the royal family, the Germans who came over from Hanover to be you know, King George I and his descendants. Um, I like the queen saying, I must be seen to be, to be believed. believed. <laughs> I yes. like her saying that. And I think she was in Bermuda. I'm not sure if it was Bermuda. It was some other place. She's on one of her t tours. And one of her PR f folks says, they finally got the point of the queen. Now, that's an interesting... They got... Yeah. Well, so th here's my question. What is the point of the queen? That's the question. The point of the queen is that she has been... First of all, she has been doing her job now for 60 years. Mm -hmm. She has been a force for stability, for unity, for continuity. Yeah. She exists above politics. She lives by example. She sets a very good example through her devoted service and living according to the values that she symbolizes. She recognizes service. That's a very important part of her job. Over 60 years, she's given out more than 400,000 awards and honors to people for civilians and military people in the military for their serving their country. She once said, people need pats on the back sometimes. Yeah. It would be a very gloomy world without it. Uh, Sally Bedell Smith's book, Elizabeth the Queen, The Life of a Modern Monarch. We're coming down to the end of our time. We are fascinated in America uh, with the British royalty. This is the Diamond Jubilee. Right. Uh, 
What can we expect, especially in June? We just have about 30 seconds. Well, there's going to be a, a blowout weekend. In the first weekend of June, there's going to be an extraordinary uh, river procession, eight miles up the Thames, a thousand um, boats of all sorts, including a, a, a sort of neo Tudor royal barge. And they're going to have a concert and fireworks and a uh, big procession, a carriage procession to St. Paul's and back. It's going to be wonderful. Thank you so much Thank you. for the education and for the book. Thank, Thank you. you, Sally. My pleasure. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, and online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. This Is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust.